Hey everyone, welcome to week eight, eight, <laughs> day one. Uh, this is a brand new week, brand new theme. And for this week, we're gonna do a getting to know you theme, which basically means just pick somebody in your life. It could be your partner, it could be your family. If you're alone, that's awesome. Just, you know, work on self-portraits. Uh, but what we're gonna try to do is just investigate uh, that person or ourselves uh, and try to find different aspects that we can emphasize each day of the week. And we're gonna do it through drawing. Now, I'm gonna do a uh, color pencil drawing. You can do charcoal, you can do graphite, you can do color pencil if you want. And I'm using uh, water-soluble uh, watercolor pencils. They're pretty soft. I actually like them because of that. I'm pairing them with some very cheap fluorescent <laughs> Uh, regular color pencils. So you're gonna see those make cameos during the week. And I'm picking Danny just because she's awesome and she's incredible in my life. So I never tire of drawing or painting her. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, so let's see how we do today. I'll see you later. Okay, uh, brand new week. And I think the first thing you're gonna notice uh, with these uh, videos is that we've shifted the camera to the side. And the reason is actually pretty simple. I work with the camera right kind of on top of me when I'm painting. But the thing is, Danny has to go through help to try and edit out every single time my head goes into frame uh, because I actually have to get close to, uh, to my painting. The uh, paintings that I, I work on and the drawings right now, just the dimensions, are very small. They're actually, every single painting that I've painted is either like five by eight, six by nine, or eight by 10. So eight by 10, I think has been the largest painting. And that's pretty small. And sometimes if I wanna be kind of precious about developing an area and putting some detail in, I have to really get close. There's no other way. My eyes aren't that good or my hand isn't you know that sweet that I can just with distance solve a bunch of detail. So the thing that happens when I draw is that I'm probably even closer to my paper than I am you know when I'm painting because at least when I'm painting I'm used to just stretching my arm out and being at arm's length from my painting. But with a color pencil and a piece of paper I'm usually very close to it. I'm not, I'm not like fixing a watch. <laughs> you know, I'm not like a clockmaker just fixing uh, watches, but, but I still get pretty close. And it would be terrible because Danny would have to edit my head out so many times that it would look like a time lapse. The uh, drawing, you wouldn't really be able to tell that I'm drawing it. It would just kind of appear out of the blue. So we'll see if we can actually work from the side and we'll see if that works for painting too. But anyways, that's just like a, an explanation of why we have our camera off to the side. This week, we're concentrating on, on drawing. And ever since I started doing these uh, rewards, and I started them maybe, it may be two years ago, I started doing the uh, drawing rewards that I had for my, for my crowdfunded project of my last book. I <laughs> I made a mistake at that moment it just seemed like a mistake because I said well I can do color pencil drawings as a reward and that was a tier and you know I had never like tried to make a color pencil drawing I don't know I had used obviously like your traditional materials to do drawing just graphite charcoal pen but I had never done anything with color pencil and I was like oh my god what did I do you know maybe this is not going to work for me so I had to um, I had to actually sort of learn how to use them as tools, and it's pretty cool because you can tell which drawings are the ones that I did first. Not that they I don't think that they're good. I actually think that they're super nice, and it's actually very cool to see how my understanding of a color pencil as a tool just changed throughout the months, and. And it's very satisfying because eventually I just felt comfortable with them again as tools and I started to push a little bit. And I actually was very happy because I was able to explore like a big array of possibilities. Some of them, some of the drawings were more rendered, some of them were cleaner, 
a bunch of them were actually rougher. I really, really like um, what a bunch of illustrators do nowadays that they just like press super, super hard on their paper with color pencil. And I just love the sort of dichotomy of a, of a mark that is done very harshly with a ton of pressure, but with a pigment that is actually soft. You know, the color pencil deposits pigment in a soft way because essentially it's, it's a waxy color. So I kind of I kind of like how that feels. And as soon as I started drawing it, drawing the uh, rewards, I realized, wow, I can actually use this tool to draw the drawing that I would have in my initial layer when I do a painting. Now, the strange thing about this is that prior to that, I had never done tight drawings for my paintings. It was so strange for me. What I would usually do is just dilute paint with terps and kind of do like a wash drawing. And I always felt comfortable like that. And I know it's tough. And the way I would work around it was that I would, uh, I would do like little prep sketches so that I would kind of understand what I wanted to do with composition and the placement of figures within the space. But I always felt super comfortable grabbing a big brush and doing a wash. Like I never felt that I needed a very tight drawing. And I always felt a tight drawing in a painting would be conditioning. Like I would always associate it with like neoclassical stuff, let's say Ang or David, that sort of work that needed a very precise drawing. But in terms of choosing sides, I always felt I was Titian or Delacroix. Now, having said that, I like drawing, not just as a step in the pursuit of a painting, but as an end in and of itself. And for example, in our history of art, we have in the, in the second part of the uh, 20th century, like in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, and 90s, he passed away in the 90s, we have one of the most, I think, prolific, uh, just talented draftsmen ever. And this is not, I don't want to sound like nationalistic. I, I know that, you know, people will be like, oh, okay, you know, this is just an endorsement of a Colombian artist. No, no, no. His name was Luis Caballero. He was my mother's teacher, actually. My mother's an artist. And he is one of the most amazing draftsmen I have ever seen, ever. I loved that when I showed Steve Vassell uh, a book of, of, of his work. He was like, oh my God, I want that book, like immediately. When he saw it, he was like, it's like Jerry. And I remember when I came back from New York, I actually went straight to the bookstore and I bought a book for him and I sent it. I was like, yeah, he, he has to have this artist. He's just a remarkable, remarkable draftsman. So I was brought up with the idea that you can be an artist that, develops their voice through drawing. Drawing doesn't have to be less than painting. I've never understood why drawings are less expensive than paintings. To me, that's just insanity. Nobody could objectively tell me why. It's like, well, you, you spend less time. Who cares about it? Like, time does not equal more expensive in art. It's ridiculous. I've seen paintings that take months that are horrible. I've seen paintings that took years that are terrible. And I've seen painted sketches that are just masterful. I've seen paintings that are developed in one session that are amazing. So I'm sorry, but nobody could argue with me that because you take more time in art, then for some reason you have just immediately gained the right to ask for more money or to think that what you have done as an object is more precious than a drawing that took less time. That to me is insanity. That that to me is something that we just arbitrarily decided upon. And, you know, it seems like the people that are in charge, they were like, yep, yep, this is true. At the National Gallery, there's the drawing that da Vinci did of Virgin Mary and St. Anne. That drawing has to be one of the most beautiful pieces of art in history. In history, in all of history. You know, if you ask me, I want to see that drawing more than I want to see uh, the Mona Lisa. That is the truth. For me, that is the truth. I, I remember when I saw the, uh, the Mona Lisa, it was an idea taking shape, like materializing in front of my eyes, you know, this image that you see everywhere in coasters and napkins and aprons and whatever. And then suddenly you just see the actual image and it was like, oh, oh my God, yeah, that's it. 
like that is it. But then I saw it, I acknowledged that that is the object, the actual object that exists. And then I moved on. And I was like, I don't know, that's, I guess that's it. You know, I guess that's, that's what, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what it looks like. But recently, when I went to the National Gallery, and I saw the Da Vinci drawing, I was like, my God, I was moved. Like, y you know, when you're moved, it's like your, your whole body is just like, I need to sit. Because it's a magnificent piece of art. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's one of the pieces, one of the most important pieces that the National Gallery has. And I mean, nobody, nobody would be able to convince me that it's less than, I, I, I think it's like right next to the um, Van Eyck's. I know, I know how powerful the Arnolfini portrait is and Van Eyck's self-portrait, but nobody would be able to convince me that it's less than those paintings. And the Arnolfini portrait is one of the most important paintings in the history of painting. And I don't care. Like those two pieces for me are exactly the same. They are as powerful. So this is just to say that even like a simple sketch or a simple drawing, it has so much energy. And the reason I've always believed that it has that power, that it has that energy, it's because of its immediacy. Because painting has to juggle a ton of variables, a ton, a ton of variables, right? And color has so many properties, you know, inherently, that whenever you see even a sketch, even a very simple sketch, there's a ton of things going on. There's a ton of variables that you have to process. But a drawing, all you need to do, an amazing drawing, is a rock and a surface. That's about it. That's all you need. The nature of drawing is the simplest act that a human being can do to just express him or herself. So in, in that sense, I've always understood the power of drawing in its immediacy. And that's why when people draw and it doesn't come out like you expect it to come out, you are frustrated immediately. Just immediately. I don't care how good or bad you are. I don't care if you feel like you're an amateur artist or if you've been drawing for 50 years, you know, the first 20 seconds of a drawing always tell you, okay, you are in the right path or, oh my God, you have no clue what you're doing. And that happens to me and that happens to every single person that is just starting out. It doesn't matter. And I think that the value that I've always seen in drawing is the fact that it speaks about decision-making. That's what your drawing really does. So for this one, for this first one, I wanted to do very, very simple drawing, uh, eliminate a lot of the, uh, of the color work, of the hue work that was very much present in the exercise that we did last week where we were reflecting upon our palette. This is just a very, very simple kind of earthy, um, almost like a sepia drawing. And what I'm trying to emphasize here in a sort of decorative way, is evoking a little bit of mukha, Alphonse mukha. In the history of drawing, mukha is very, very, very important. And he is probably one of the most delicate, sharpest examples of what clarity in mark making can do. He was doing work that was obeying a certain ideology, a certain iconography. Um, mukha was part of Art Nouveau. And there were aesthetic values that were already sort of imprinted upon um, uh, working within those, you know, parameters. But, you know, aside from all of that, from the, from the sort of stylistic rules that you had to work within, Mucha's hand is just masterful. It's just absolutely masterful. He, he has one of the most beautiful hands in drawing history. His ability to design and to go from from just pattern to form to hair to pattern back again, it's, it, it's insane. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm not doing an ornate example of what a, a very elaborate Art Nouveau drawing design exercise is because I am starting you know, with Danny and I want to be faithful with the shapes of Danny, 
what I'm trying to do is to just concentrate on the um, the contour of those shapes, the outer contour of those shapes. It's almost like if Danny was enclosed by this sharper contour. And um, and I'm, I'm just trying to emphasize that a little bit. So she is kind of enclosed by this ornate shape. Muka did work as an illustrator. He did advertising, really. I mean, advertising for the arts because he used to do um, these posters for uh, theater. But he also did ads for uh, cigarettes and chocolate. So Muka, in, in a sense, was just an illustrator. Today, a person that is evoking everything that Muka did, you know, a century ago, over a century ago, is um, Adam Hughes. You know, I know sometimes when we mention comic book artists, people that have a, a very traditional foundation and education with painting feel that comic book is a little bit lowbrow. I've... <laughs> I've never seen it that way, to be 100% honest. I think all these arts are just tied together, like at their core. I've told you guys before, but I was going to be a comic book artist, and eventually I became an illustrator, and now I am a painter. But in my mind, I haven't changed at all. Like To me, the path has just been one, and it all has been tied together. So subject matter aside, Adam has one of the most incredible just drafting capabilities of anyone I've ever seen today. He is insane. If you could if you if you can see a video of him drawing, it's just just an incredible ability. And he has this over Muka. Muka actually worked a ton from photographs. He actually gridded a lot of his photographs to try and and um and translate his photos into drawing and transfer his photos into drawings. But Adam works from his head, just from imagination. So it's just insane. He is absolutely remarkable. Again, very Muka, obviously, but it's brought to the um, comic book industry and uh, to uh, today's kind of comic book, uh, I guess, needs. And I think he's a genius for it. So that was the first drawing today. I, I thought it would be really cool if we started out with something pretty elegant and simple, nice. And we didn't throw in like a lot of color right from the start. And we would emphasize design. And all of this, like I said in the intro of the video, just to get us a little bit closer to Danny. Uh, the idea of this whole week is to try and investigate. And if you don't want to work with somebody else, if you're alone, and that's totally cool and that's totally fine, do it with yourself. You know, it's time to do self-portraits then. Uh, for me, it's going to be Danny that I think I know super, super well. But I've always, always loved drawing her because every time I, I have the uh, chance to sit down and just look at her for a couple of hours, it, it's like I learned something new about her form and about her gestures and her attitude and, and just her spirit just kind of shines through in the drawing. So I'm super happy to be able to do that this week. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.